Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete what is most likely going to be one of the last episodes in this series. It's not going to be the last episode, that much I can tell you, but we are definitely fast approaching the grand finale. Now, last time we left off after successfully taking care of a group of refugees, some would say perhaps even a bit too successfully, because four of them, almost half of their numbers, now want to join us. And your comments on the last episode were very clear about what you want to see happen here, so staying true to the spirit of Boyo, we will accept them all. So we start things off with Dennis, who was actually named after a fellow German YouTuber and streamer. Now he will receive a new name from the list of Patreon supporters in the naming rights tier and above. So we welcome Mook to the colony, a nudist night owl who will mostly spend his time with our animals, and perhaps also do some mining and plant work in between. Moving on then, our next colonist, very handy with plants as well and also with art, her new name, Skark, after the patron supporter of the same name. As a misandrist, she might have a bit of a hard time in our colony, otherwise though there is nothing special to report about her. That brings us then to the refugee's leader, who will now receive the name Shandy. Also a misandrist, but with passions in the medical and social skill, she might walk in the footsteps of Kevin, she also has decently high intellectual, crafting and animal skills, even though an old gunshot wound in her neck is hampering her a bit. And that brings us to the fourth and final recruit we now acquire here today. He will now receive the extremely unique name of John. And no, there is nothing else to it, the naming rights patron here is also just named that. Nonetheless, John is very capable when it comes to melee fighting, construction work and medical. He also has a few scars, but those don't seem to affect him too much. And so we now welcome a fast walking quick sleeper into our ranks. Despite the lazy trade, I think he should become a productive member of our colony. Just a few moments later then, the remaining refugees, those that do not want to join us, are leaving again. Eventually, the last one makes it off the map and we complete the quest, and as a reward we earn two more ideology development points. And so, our new recruits get comfortable in their new home. Mook perhaps not quite as comfortable as the others, as he now gets his right leg replaced with a prosthetic one. Even though that will not give him back full efficiency, it is still better than the one he has. And now that he is officially a member of the colony, we can also operate on him without suffering any penalties. Just in that moment, Maniac also awakens from his gene implantation. So the 80 year old is now officially deathless, as well as psychically sensitive and pyrophobic. The birth of a new elephant then gives us the chance to pick yet another name from the list of patron supporters. Vickery, now the latest addition to our colony, so welcome and thank you very much for your support. At this point, this series alone is getting close to 50 names used. Let's see how many more we can get before the series ends. Speaking of elephants, we also have to give some titles to Lem and Olex, who joined us last episode. And this time it does actually fit, so Lem will now be Lieutenant Lem, while Olex will receive the title of Oligarch. And of course, let me know your suggestions for Vickery in the comments down below too. I have a feeling though that it's going to be Viscount, but of course I am very open to other ideas. Now, one thing we also have to take care of at this point is converting our new recruits. Kevin here already off to a good start with Shandy, but it will most likely take us quite a while to convert all four of them, even with our proselytizers doing their best to accelerate the process. Bad news then in the evening, as we have a mech cluster drop in, I believe this is the first one of the series actually, and this one is particularly interesting because it arrives in a dormant state. This one here has a countdown activator keeping it in that state for about three days, so at least in theory there is no need for us to engage it immediately, and we might even be able to use it against our enemies, that is should some of them appear in the next three days and get too close to the cluster. For my taste, however, all of that is leaving just a bit too much up to chance. Our colonists are mostly in a good mood at the moment and nobody is incapacitated, so I think it's best if we strike now. And well, what can I say? At this point it does pay off that we have picked up the Neuroquake Psycast last episode, as we are now sending light out and close to the mechanoids, where first of all he will now turn invisible. With that taken care of, we then utilize another recent purchase, the Doomsday Rocket Launcher, and we want to aim it so that it blows up the unstable power cell right next to the turrets over here. That succeeds and light is still invisible for a few seconds, however not for long enough, so let's recast invisibility to get the timer back up to 15 seconds. 
Doing this is very important because we need a grand total of 12 seconds to cast Neuroquake and getting discovered at this point could be somewhat problematic. Now, unfortunately, casting the Neuroquake is interrupted by Light's Pyrophobia, although I am not entirely sure what exactly he's afraid of here. Thankfully, he also calms down pretty much right away, but at this point we have to recast both Invisibility and the Neuroquake, and as you can see, we have a decent number of mechs already making their way over to our base. So it looks like a handful of them might just escape the Neuroquake's radius. However, I am not too worried about that. Their enraged companions will most likely make quick work of them. Not to mention that we have assembled a good chunk of firepower ourselves. The relationship penalty is here then unfortunate, but in case of an emergency like this, I think understandable. And speaking of that emergency, luckily the Neuroquake has affected most of the mechanoids, so we can now employ the tried and tested skip them where it hurts approach for those that might pose a threat. As you can see though, that's really not a whole lot of them. Unfortunately, Kraleth is suffering a few minor injuries in the process, but most likely nothing that will keep her out of action for long. And so, with the immediate threat defeated and the rest of the mechanoids fighting each other, we will now take care of the turrets, and to do so we will now skip in Wyatt. And thanks to that skip psychast, the first volley here also completely misses him. From this close meanwhile, the turret cannot even target him, and even if any of that were different, he does have a shield belt too, so I think he should come out of this in one piece. And there we go, the first turret is about to explode, the next one here shouldn't take too long to destroy either. Should he come under more enemy fire, we do also have access to the smoke pop psychast, but I'll be honest, I don't really think it's going to be necessary. After all, we are now already two auto turrets down, one more to go, the shield is still holding, and the mechs have more or less decimated each other too. And with that, we now only have the small mini slugger turret left, not really much of a threat for someone as heavily armored as Wyatt, and with its destruction, the mech cluster is officially considered defeated. All that is left at this point is a single centipede, and well, I think Wyatt has earned himself a trophy kill to finish things off here. Let's see if he can take it down in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Admittedly though, it's not exactly a fair one, considering that the centipede is already heavily damaged. And so it goes down, and with that, the fight is now officially over. Dimitri then the one to eventually haul Light back home. You might recall this from our Cult of Jinx series, but after casting Neuroquake, he is now in a 5-day psychic coma. Nonetheless, that Neuroquake did help us not only defeat this mech cluster, but it has also caused a vast amount of animals to attack each other, so getting meat on the menu should not be a problem for the foreseeable future. And thanks to all the loot we have acquired over the last 24 hours, our colony wealth now almost where we want it to be, just a few hundred silver shy of the 275,000 mark. Now maybe that changes in a bit, as it looks like we are about to do some trading here, but at least for a brief moment in time, the second piece of the Arconexus map is now officially available, so in theory we could end the series right here and now. However, that is not quite the plan that I have. I would like to at least have Ellie age up once more, because, and I think this is no surprise, she will of course be a part of that next series, and from here I think you can make your own bets on what that means for the rest of our colonists. In the meantime, Kevin approaches the trader and we are mostly doing some selling here. Despite the acquisition of over 100 units of Nutriamin, we still make a lovely profit, and we should also receive a small boost to our recently damaged faction relations. For the rest of the day then, the jungle remains clouded in fog until in the late afternoon the royal tribute collector arrives, and this time we are actually going to use them. As I have mentioned before, we still want to get Kevin up to the rank of knight, and to get there he only needs three more points of honor, three points that we can easily grab with just a small donation of 200 gold. And there we go, our resident speaker of sacrifice is ready to become a knight, and I don't think there is any reason to delay the ceremony, even though the royal bestower just had to land their shuttle all the way on the other side of the map. Now, while they make their way over to us, we make a curious discovery, as one of the refugees from earlier, Freckles, is actually still here, and why wouldn't she? After all, we already talked about this last time, she literally can't move, alcohol withdrawal and malnutrition have completely knocked her out. 
However, with the associated quest already completed, we now have a bit more leeway in how to deal with her. While we also want to make sure that our new nudist actually behaves as one, the hood is apparently still fine, but everything else Murk now strips off. I think for a permanent plus 20 mood bonus we will be fine with that. After all, in the jungle it's nice and cozy, even underneath the mountain. The bestowing ceremony then, at this point only a formality for our colonists. It is once again an honourable one, earning Kevin three additional points of honour, but more importantly than that, he is now a knight and that means he can officially trade with the Empire. So we no longer need Brandon to do that, even though he might occasionally still come just for his fast skip sidecast. Speaking of which, for Kevin's third sidecast, I think there is only one choice that makes sense here and it is of course Word of Love. Perhaps we can even use that to repair the relationship between Took and Squigs, although since they are technically still married, I somewhat doubt it. However, if there are other couples that you would like to see us bring to life, then feel free to let me know in the comments. After all, these might be our last days here in the jungle. The arrival of an exotic goods trader then presents us with another trading opportunity, so let's get to it right away. And this one may sting a bit, but I think it's time. We are now officially saying goodbye to the last two bears. Considering the number of elephants we have, I think it's just the sensible decision. So farewell to Jen and Cobalt. Now, with the money we earn from their sale, we will first of all purchase, yes, a new liver, as we might still have a guest suffering from cirrhosis who could use this. To further move along our replication of the Sanguophage via gene modding, we then obviously also have to grab this gene pack right here. This one requiring another archite capsule, but adding the gene implanter feature. In my opinion, a very powerful tool, and we can even grab an archite capsule on top of it. And this is actually not going to be the only gene pack we purchase here today. As you can see, there are four more available, and this one here containing super immunity intrigues me. Once again, it is another step towards replicating the Sanguophage, who actually have perfect immunity. But I suppose this is our way of doing what we can to mirror their abilities. Now, we are not going to create a new and improved version of the bloodless Sanguophage Xenogerm right away, mostly also because we would need a second Archite capsule for that. So for the moment, we can watch as Squix receives a taming inspiration and we complete the research of the Vitals Monitor. So at this point, we are now capable of building the perfect hospital, not that we would be too far away from that anyway, and that pretty much completes all of the major projects I had on my list for this series. So let's get a few of the basics checked off next, just because we can. Solar panels, hydroponics, maybe a few weapon projects, that sort of stuff. We will take all of the already unlocked research projects with us into the next series, so grabbing a few of those basics that we have not yet unlocked might make some sense even though I mostly want to stay focused on stuff that does make sense within the scope of this series. In the evening then, Wyatt finishes making a second prosthetic leg and that means it's time for Freckles to receive some upgrades. First of all, we will remove her liver cirrhosis by giving her the one that we just purchased and we will also replace the peg leg that she came with with a prosthetic leg. And yes, I know that it says here that this will anger her faction. However, with all other living members of this faction already off the map, this won't have any consequences. And so Dimitri here successfully completes the procedure. And with that, she should be good to go as soon as the anesthetic wears off and perhaps after we give her something to eat. On the next morning then, solar panels are already unlocked. That's the benefit of having three full-time researchers. So let's continue with hydroponics. Those might actually be useful to have under the mountain but at least so far we've been able to make do without them. Eventually then Freckles gets out of bed and is in fact walking again, slowly, but I think it's safe to say that we fixed her. Whether or not she can now overcome her addiction, that is up to her. Now it does take her a good few hours to make it off the map, but that's the most exciting thing that happens here today. In the evening then we begin work on yet another bedroom. Of course, we do not want our new recruits to keep occupying the guest barracks. As the next morning rolls around, we breeze through another research project, this time hydroponics. And I have to say, at this point, I'm not entirely sure what exactly we should research. My first instinct was to go with shields until I noticed that it's actually considered space attack. And then I had the idea of going with biosculpting, which is something that you would normally find prioritized in a transhumanist ideology. Now, we are not exactly that, although on a good path towards one. And the biosculpting part that we unlock this way does have a few interesting features that would fit right in, namely in regards to helping and healing people. Once again then, the remainder of the day remains mostly uneventful. In the evening we can see that Ellie has actually almost surpassed her father's cooking skill. Took at level 16, Ellie at 15 and rising quickly. 
The simple reason for that? Plenty of meals that we had to make from all that meat we recovered. Before the day is completely over, we also want to perform one more conversion ritual. This one though not for Shandy, that would be a waste considering that we have her almost converted, instead Skark will be the target. With a bit of luck we achieve a masterful outcome and convert her in one go. As you can see though, that does not seem to be the case, instead it is only an effective ritual. Still, we earn a development point and Skark should be converted within the next few days. Newcomer Shandy meanwhile receives a trade inspiration in the middle of the night, so I suppose our next non-Empire trade trip will involve her. For the moment however, we are constructing a small sterile room right at the end of our corridor over here. This is where our biosculpting part will eventually go. Following up on another technological advancement, we can also construct two solar panels over by the river here. We do have just enough open space to squeeze both of them in, and at least during the day this will now add an additional 3500 watts to our power output. In the late afternoon then, we are informed of a boomalope self-taming, and while I usually tend to use self-tamed animals as additional meat supply, in this case not only do we have enough meat, but an extra boomalope might come in handy, so let's welcome Cackleon or Cacklion, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce it. Either way, welcome to the colony. Just in that moment then, we also have some slightly troublesome news from Took, who decided that this right here is the best spot to hunt elephants. And well, unfortunately, even with a maniac nearby, there is nothing that he or his stun sidecast can do in this situation, so I guess we'll just have to hope that Took doesn't die. And thankfully, he only goes down, and not without putting up a fight. The man-hunting animals then are quickly massacred by the rest of our colonists. Nonetheless, for Took, the clock is ticking. Luckily, Sanguophage Volek is still benefiting from his glucosoid rush, and so he makes it over to Took just in time to use his coagulate ability. And from the brink of death, Took jumps back up on his feet. Or at least on the one foot he still has, because as you can see here, his left leg has been torn off. At least he still has an Arcotech leg on the other side, which he can now use to hobble back home. To memorialize this dance with death, we will now also have ourselves a burning of sins ritual. Obviously, a Turk is not going to make it home in time to participate, but the main recipient of this ritual is supposed to be light anyway. As you can see, after reawakening from his psychic coma, his psi focus is awfully diminished, and having a positive outcome for this ritual is an easy way to refill that. And it is indeed a fun ritual, setting the psi focus of all participants back to 100%. What's more, we also earn ourselves another ideology development point, and that means we could actually reform the believers of Boyo yet again, despite having done so the last time just two episodes ago. At the moment though, I have no plans of actually doing so, but who knows what our last few days or weeks here in the jungle will bring. For now, they very fittingly bring us an eclipse, just after we have constructed two solar generators. Still, our water mills bring us enough power to keep the base going, and so we finish the research of biosculpting in no time. Now, unfortunately, to make the most out of the biosculptor pot, we also need to research bioregeneration. And despite the fact that this unlocks some pretty advanced tech, it is still considered an industrial project. So let's get on with it, even though at a cost of 8000 points, it will take a little longer to complete. The biosculptor part itself, meanwhile, is already available to be constructed, and so let's put it down in the sterile room that we have already prepared for it. Now, the biosculptor part has four modes of operation, one of which we still need to unlock. However, in order to use any of them, we need to put in some nutrition. And of course, we are using meat for that, because we are actually about to run into the problem of having too much of it. At this point then, the pod offers us three options. The medic cycle basically heals a pawn's wounds and illnesses, although it will not heal scars or recover lost limbs. That is what the bioregeneration cycle is for that we are currently still researching. The other two meanwhile, age reversal and pleasure, really not that useful outside of a transhumanist colony. Age reversal in particular only reversing a pawn's age by a single year. The speed of all these procedures meanwhile is affected by the room's cleanliness, which is why we have it placed in this sterile chamber. There is a bit more to it, but I think for now we will just wait until the bioregeneration research is completed. In the meantime, we will restore body parts the old-fashioned way, in Tuk's case by installing a prosthetic alternative. And so, with an Arcotech leg on one side and a prosthetic leg on the other, he will hopefully be up and about in no time. We at least can skip ahead to the dawn of a new morning. And with the eclipse ending, it is perfect weather to send out a few drop parts. 
As advertised, these will include the trade-inspired shandy as well as light, and of course a whole lot of valuable trade goods. As always, loading everything into the parts takes a few hours, but with nothing of interest happening in the meantime, we can then actually skip ahead until we are ready for the launch. And we are going to send them to a place that I think we have visited a few times now. Their inventory, however, has restocked, so I'm very curious to see what they have for sale. Now, selling our goods already makes us well over 6,000 silver. Don't worry though, we will also purchase a good amount of stuff here, starting with another organ, a lung in this case, and we will also grab the bionic arm and spine. For the spine, I do not yet have a recipient in mind, for the other two meanwhile I do. In terms of gene packs then, nothing that really intrigues me, certainly a few things that might be situationally useful, but for this playthrough I think we'll stick to replicating the Sangophage. Also, instead of spending the 3000 silver here to purchase an Arcotech Eye, let's spend it on a triple rocket launcher. Not quite a doomsday, which is what I would have preferred, but at least for the moment it will have to do. And so Light skips our small caravan back home to unload its inventory, which now brings us to the recipient of that lung we purchased, Kevin. Since we recruited him in the last series, Kevin is suffering from asthma, a condition that I think our charitable believers of Boyo would be interested to fix. Unfortunately, a pawn has two lungs, so a single one will only cure half of the asthma, but still, half is better than nothing, and who knows, we might just find a second lung before the series is over. The bionic arm, meanwhile, that one will go on Wyatt, not only to replace his injured one, but also because he receives various useful bonuses from it, most notably an improved melee hit chance and improved crafting speed, which is basically how he spends 90% of his time. And so, with those few improvements taken care of, another knight sets across the jungle. A knight that we used to convert the first of our new recruits, Shandy. At this point, however, we have already maxed out our development points, so we will not be receiving any further ones. On the following afternoon, then, we are once again hunting ourselves some elephants. Yes, our fridge may still be fully stocked with meat, but we also receive leather and elephant tusks from hunting them. And over the last few days, our colony wealth has actually dropped a little bit again, so obviously we want to get that back up as soon as we can. And perhaps another building project might help us in that endeavor. I think it is clear to see what this is going to become. More sleeping quarters, either for our colonists or for prisoners. Unfortunately, work is soon interrupted as we are once again getting attacked. And unfortunately, by what are probably my least favorite enemies in this series, Impits. Now, interestingly enough, these raiders bring with them some romantic complications. Apparently among them we have the fiancé of our recent recruit John, and, perhaps even more interesting than that, Light's lover. Now in total there is three groups of them, each one consisting of a moderate amount of enemies, but like I said, impits can be extremely annoying, especially if you have some sangophages in your ranks. So phase one of our defense here involves Volek triggering some rhinos, only to then use his super fast running speed to lead them directly to the first group of enemies. Once they are in range, Volek can jump back out and will let the rhinos take care of the rest. Admittedly, this will most likely not do a whole lot of damage, but it definitely has the potential to soften up this group a bit. For group number two then, the one in the middle, we employ a rather familiar strategy. An invisible light will skip himself in close and then use a rocket launcher. This time only the triple variant, not a doomsday. Still, these are tribals and not exactly heavily armored. After reapplying the invisibility, we can then also drop two berserk pulses, just for good measure. And I think that should be enough to already take care of this group. And that leaves us with the one at the top at the moment entirely unharmed. Still, we have almost as many elephants as there are enemies in that group, so I'm hoping that we should be fine. In the meantime, group number one is already fleeing. The rhinos, meanwhile, didn't do quite as much damage as I had hoped. And so at this point, the bulk of the attackers are just about to hit our defenses. Wyatt deploys a skip shield to keep us safe from what is almost exclusively ranged weaponry. However, in hindsight, I'm not exactly sure whether or not that was a good idea because it forces the impets to get close and, well, when they do, they really like to spew fire, and unfortunately that can derail even the best laid plans. And so the battlefield quickly turns into an absolute inferno as we unleash the elephants. I will admit it has been a while since I felt completely overwhelmed by an enemy attack, and yes, of course, we could just use another Neuroquake to quickly get rid of these guys, 
but I feel like from a role-playing standpoint, the believers of Boyo would be cautious about using that too often. It does, after all, seem to affect their neighbors too, and with some of those we do have a pretty good relationship. At this point then, you can see we are pulling back our forces just a little bit, but things are absolutely chaotic. Yes, the second enemy group has decided to flee, but after fleeing the fire himself, Dimitri here is caught in no man's land. And to make matters even worse, we have a toxic fallout set in, just in case you were itching for one of those typical RimWorld moments. Now, to my great relief, it doesn't take long until the third and last enemy group decides to flee. Unfortunately, to fend them off, Light also had to surpass his neural heat limit, and as a result has now developed a psychic breakdown. His up to this point unknown lover, by the way, did also get killed in the fight. John, meanwhile, a bit more lucky, his fiancée apparently able to escape and already off the map, so no way for us to get the two of them together. And as if all of that wasn't bad enough, we also have our elephant Archon Ariel downed and burning, and even with Vulek rushing over to apply the coagulate, we are not able to save her. So a sad, sad casualty at the hands of these impets, and one that we will sadly not even be able to bury, despite the rain setting in, the corpse did unfortunately burn away. Now, on the bright side, I guess, using our coagulate ability on some of our enemies, we are able to take two prisoners, even though our own ranks are not exactly looking stellar at the moment either. Lots of injuries and some of them quite severe, including Ellie, who is thankfully though only lightly injured. And so, with a chaotic raid defeated and with a toxic fallout forcing us to harvest what little crops we grow outside, I think we have reached a good or at least adequate point to make the cut in today's episode. Lots of drama here as we get close to the finish line, but that's just the way I like it. And if you enjoyed it too, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can of course also go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.